Happy Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and Friends of Baylor. And of course, the New York Times has great articles because of my, my sister. Uh, news from Alpha Genesis in South Carolina that, that is the home of 7,000 research primates. They were feeding 50 of these uh, little uh, monkeys and 43 escaped. Now the good news is that uh, they've recaptured 25. They're telling everybody in the local town, keep your windows and doors shut, just in case of one thing. And, I, and the real concern, and I think this is why the New York Times published this, is that the rest of them are all moving to the Upper West Side of New York looking for apartments. So Janet, keep your windows <laughs> shut and the door closed. Let, let the doorman know if he sees a monkey, not let him in. Anyway, also good news, the FDA lifted its, its uh, halt on the uh, combined COVID-19 and flu shot that Novavax is developing, so they're free to move forward. That's a big, uh, big step forward. Be nice to have a combined shot. And okay, so let's go right down to avian flu, H5N1. Um, I don't quite understand why we're not doing more, but it continues to be a pretty significant uh, infection. So 56% of a large breeding colony of Caspian terns, these are, I call them seagulls, but they're Caspian terns, 56% uh, of them died uh, in Vancouver. And so there's an island, uh, there was a huge outbreak, they lost 1,000 adults, 500 chicks, and they have not been able to have, um, they have not successfully bred on the island ever since. So it, it's beginning to affect uh, populations of terns on, uh, in Canada, Vancouver, and Washington. So far, uh, over 10,500 wild birds have been infected, 105 million poultry, 48 states, states with poultry outbreaks, and 473 dairy, dairy herds that we know of. I mentioned before that with dairy farmers, they have to invite the, uh, the, in, the, the government in to actually test, and so if they don't invite, we don't know, so it's probably a pretty big understatement of the problem. And 50, 15 states that have outbreaks with dairy cattle. But, you know, if you look at across the country, there's been, <laughs> there's avian flu in a lot of different animals. So this is a, just an example of all the different animals that have been uh, identified with H5N1 who, who died. A bobcat, domestic cats, of course, we know about a mountain lion, uh, a bottlenose dolphin, gray seals, harbor seals, uh, raccoons, a skunk. I'm not sure why they tested a skunk for H5N1, but the point is, it's getting into a lot of mammalian species. It's not yet, in, you know, going from one to another in those populations, but it has done it in seals, has done it in dairy cattle, is doing it in chickens. And if you look at H5 one in, in uh, detection in wastewater, there's a significant signal in California, which was the dairy industry. And of course, we're now up to 46 human cases. None of them have been transmitted from person to person. So that's the big concern. If it ever is able to transmit person to person, we will have another pandemic. But there was a teenager from British Columbia who's tested positive. No known exposure. He got admitted to the hospital with what looked like a pneumonia. And most of the other cases in humans have been like a conjunctivitis, upper respiratory infection, not a pneumonia, but this kid had pneumonia. They tested all the people who were taking care of him, and uh, no one has been tested positive. So there's no evidence that it's gone from uh, like a case like his to the caregivers. But this is another kind of worrisome thing. Um, you know, I mentioned the 46 cases in humans that have been uh, identified, but the CDC collected blood from 150 dairy farm workers who are asymptomatic, and just to see whether or not they had antibodies to H5N1, and that would show that they were infected, even if they were asymptomatic. What they found of the 150 samples they tested, eight people tested positive, so they had antibodies to bird flu, which means they were infected, but managed the infection. In retrospect, half of them, four of them, were said they did have you know, sort of symptoms, and the other four were asymptomatic. But again, it shows you that if you're a dairy worker and you're around uh, cattle that are infected, <laughs> the virus is getting into people. And so based on those findings, the CDC has been uh, saying they should test, uh, they should do more testing of, of people. Uh, they recommended they, they actually start treating with Tamiflu for all people who are working in the dairy industry uh, who have a high risk for exposure. Uh, and they've been focusing again on PPE, protective 
clothing for, for workers. I, don't, I do not know why they don't want to start vaccinating cattle or vaccinating people who, uh, who are exposed to that industry. I, I, I really don't get it. It seems to me it's time. A lot of virus around, a lot of different mammals being infected. The last thing we need is to have this succeed as a human-to-human -human transmission. Well, the influenza season is beginning. Uh, you can see that in wastewater, it's not a huge signal as of yet, but I want to show you last year's influenza season. So this is the number of tests that were positive, and you can see it begins right in the 40th week. That's November 3rd. That was this week. It starts there, begins to inch up, and then it peaks right at the end of December and into January, and then starts coming down. That's a typical influenza season. Well, this is where we are, November 3rd, the week of November 3rd. See that little uptick? That's exactly the way it was last year. So you can anticipate we are right in the beginning of influenza season and we're beginning to see cases. So if you haven't gotten your vaccine, please get your vaccine. And it looks like it's a good match for this year's uh, influenza. There was an interesting study uh, in science that looked at what was the impact of COVID on influenza. So if you, if you look at um, air travel, pre-pandemic, you can see this is the blue line. And the red line is, is starting stringency, public health restrictions and masking and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and you can see as stringency went up, air travel dropped dramatically. This was the genetic sort of pattern of influenza A uh, pre-pandemic. And then you can see disappeared completely in right in the middle of 2020 began to reemerge re when things got loose again, when it, as, as you can see, when they, they lightened up on our restrictions and air travel picked up in 2023, you can see it began to look a little bit more like the original. And by 2024, we're back to the original pattern. So really good example, both uh, historically and genetically, how COVID, because everyone was masked and separated, really made influenza disappear, but as restrictions have been eased and we're back to traveling and exposing ourselves to everybody else, it's returning the original seasonal flu. All right, COVID-19. Uh, I mentioned before uh, last week that it had been falling and it's now sort of plateaued. If you look at the uh, wastewater analysis, it's all very low. The blue means it's, you know, uh, zero to 20 percent of what it was in the past. But if you look at what's happened in the last 15 days, you begin to see a lot more red dots, particularly around Chicago. I don't know what's going on in Chicago, but I, I think that's where the first outbreaks for COVID are going to be. And then it says, this uh, graph is how many have shown an increase in the last 15 days, and virtually every single wastewater analysis or site has shown an increase. So uh, once again, it looks like we're beginning to have the emergence of COVID. Remember, that's an early indicator. So. Uh, if you haven't gotten your COVID vaccine, good time to get it. No evidence yet, because this is emergency room, so it's sort of flat, flattened. I expect that because of this rising uh, amount of virus around in wastewater, we will begin to see more emergency room cases. No, you know, hospitalizations aren't increasing yet. That would be even a, a more lagging indicator. But as you can see, uh, it's a beginning to rise a little in, in wastewater. Uh, Virus, COVID-19 virus continues to evolve. Uh, XEC, well, you talked about that one from a recombinant from Denmark and Germany, is now 28% of the virus, 52% being KP 3.1.1. And that's the same as the traveler's data. So if you look at people coming, flying into airports, it's beginning to flatten out again. And very similar kind of reflection, KP3 and XEC are the dominant strains. Uh, as we look to TEFI, our Texas Epidemic Public Health Institute that sort of looks at all the viruses in wastewater in Texas. Uh, a lot of increased parainfluenza is back up. You can see our RSV beginning to come up. SARS-CoV-2 is sort of flat but is rising. Uh, MPOX is coming down finally. Um, Enterovirus 68 finally coming down. But influenza A is beginning to increase. And I want to end today with a new category, no accounting for stupidity. I was, including physicians. <laughs> there is an Idaho, the Idaho Southwest District Health Board voted four to three to remove COVID-19 vaccines from its facilities because 300 public comments uh, were made about removing uh, because of the dangers of, of vaccination. And Dr. Ryan Cole, a pathologist, 
knowingly shared disinformation about COVID-19 and broke medical standards by prescribing ivermectin to COVID-19 patients against medical evidence. And he is now, his license has been suspended in Washington, Washington State as well. But I mean, really, I mean, now the public health department is not providing vaccinations for COVID-19. I mean, holy, we will end. We may not have another category of this, <laughs> no accounting for stupidity, but it might have to be a recurring thing. Anyway, I want to end today with a bunch of shout outs. First of all, uh, Baylor Medicine Clinics were recognized by the American Heart Association for their commitment to improving health outcomes, uh, particularly in the cardiovascular patients around uh, evidence-based care and coordinated care. They have shown improved, uh, across the board improved care for patients with high blood pressure, cholesterol, elevations, and type 2 diabetes. So big shout out to all the faculty. It takes a real effort to be, to be acknowledged by the American Heart Association for providing good care across the board. Also, I want to congratulate Dr. James Lubsky, the Cullen Foundation Endowed Chair and Professor of Molecular and Human Genetics and Pediatrics, who received the 2024 American Society of Human Genetics Lifetime Achievement Award this award recognizes substantial and far-reaching scientific contributions to human genetics, and this is well-deserved honor for Dr. Lubsky's fantastic geneticist. And of course, <laughs> this is our ninth year of our partnership with the Hess Toy Truck. Uh, we developed a STEM guide uh, that we provide with these Hess trucks. Uh, they are, and this is the 2024 holiday Hess truck groupings. <laughs> you can see them here. It's not just one truck, it's a truck. It's got a, what is that, a police car, and for some reason a motorcycle, police motorcycle. And the great thing is you can give this to your grandchildren, <laughs> drive the parents crazy, and leave, <laughs> which is what I plan to do for my holiday gifts. Anyway, congratulations to the Hess Toy Truck Company uh, in their 60th year of the holiday Hess Toy Trucks, which is why they They've expanded to three different components. Anyway, have a wonderful weekend, and I can't wait to see you next week. <laughs>